I put Raymond on the spot and asked him to do our greeting. Um, sometimes, sometimes you have to be you have to be able to adapt in the moment. You know that, and um, that's what Pastor is fixing to do. We are about to adapt in the moment. <laughs> Miss Jenna, Miss Jenna was scheduled to speak with us today, and she's not able to be here, and so um, I'm going to come and orate some things to you. Um, last night we left work, and we all disperse and do what we do and I found myself doing something that I don't do those of you that know that I stay up super late and I get up super early I, I normally navigate on about four hours of sleep a day um, but last night I went to bed I was in bed at eight o'clock um, which was which was bizarre for me and I uh, Miss Pam she gave a testimony to that that's how she does it um, I know scientifically they say you need at least eight hours of sleep. I don't do that. But last night I went to bed at 8 o'clock and then promptly at 1241, I was wide awake. <laughs> and as we tend to do in the middle of the night, we begin to process things. Our mind begins to, to replay people, places, and things that we have experienced, encountered, and been a part of. A lot of the times in the wee hours, those are not things that are usually pleasant. They're not things that have been done to us that have brought about great fruit or things that we have done that have been great fruit. And what will be birthed out of that is there'll be a, a, usually a seed of offense towards somebody or something that's planted in those moments. But as I laid there last night and I had some things on a reel in my mind, I heard the Lord very clear to, clearly say to me, let all that you do be done in love. And I thought, huh, what an interesting statement to make at 12.41 in the morning when I would really prefer to be, still be asleep, but if we're going to do this, let's do this. And so I'm going to share with you the download that the Lord reminded me of in the wee hours of the morning for several hours, and then He allowed me at about three to fall back asleep um, and then wake up a little while later after that. And so... I'm going to share with you what the Lord has shared with me this morning in the hopes that you will understand that all that you are to do is to be done in love. Yes. Amen? Amen? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I ask you to bless the reading of your word this morning. I ask you to, to speak through me clearly. Let everything that is done today be done by you, through you, and for you. Lord, we give you all the honor. We give you all the praise. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Love. We throw the word love around very, very easily, right? We, we love mama. We love tacos. Pastor loves fast cars and loud music. We use the word love and we apply it to everything and not truly understanding what love is. And so today my hope is, is that when we leave here, you have a clear understanding of the love that God calls you to have not only for yourself and for him, but for others. You have to operate from a place of love. I'm going to read to you very quickly the very scripture that God gave me this morning. It is in 1 Corinthians chapter 16. Paul is writing to the church of Corinth. He's, he's laying out some groundwork. He's giving them instructions and greetings. But then he tells them, in, he tells them to be alert, to stand firm in the faith, and to act like men. But then he stops, there's a, there's a period, and then he goes on and he says this in verse 14 of chapter 16. He says, let all that you do be done in love. Well, it's interesting that the word Paul talks about continually about love, and so you've got to understand what Paul's talking about. So he's, he's writing, if you understand the text of your Bible, that the Old Testament is written in Hebrew, and when Hebrew is written, those words have one meaning. But then the New Testament is written in the Greek, and in the Greek, words have multiple meanings. And so when you see the word love is used, love has three meanings in the Greek. There's eros, there's, there's the eros love, which is where we get our word erotica. That is a sexual kind of love. We can talk about that in the church. We're not going to today. I'm giving you some groundwork, so don't, don't hear what I'm not saying. Then there's phileo love, 
That's, that is a warm or friendly love between brothers. It's a brotherly love. That's even, you can even apply that to family love. When you, have, when you have love with your mama or your daddy, that is a type of phileo love. That's where we get our word Philadelphia from. Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. Those of us that are Dallas Cowboys Week fans, we don't see that. We don't see any brotherly love from the city of Philadelphia. How, hey, amen. But then there's another one. There's the word agape. And agape is an unconditional love without, everybody say without, condition. That's what Paul's talking about here. He's not talking about just having a warm, friendly love because see, the thing is, is with an erotic love or a phileo or a, a, a philippi love, those loves come with conditions. Those loves come with a guideline. But an agape love comes with, I love you simply because that's who I am. And so agape love, whenever Paul says, let all that you do be done in love, what he's saying is you do it with a God type love. How does God love you? God loves you without condition. God loves you without a barrier. Now, I've heard somebody say, well, God can't love me because of my sin. God loves you in spite of your sin. God will love you. Here's the thing about the love of the Father. The Father loves you whether you love Him back or not. He loves you whether you accept Him or not. I heard somebody tell me one time, God will love you as you go straight to hell. Love doesn't change, but we have to make a decision in our relationship. God cannot change from who His character is. The Word of God says that God is love. He is that agape, unconditional love that is there to love you, cover you, mold you, and protect you. That's what that is. Amen? Amen. Are we doing okay? Yes, sir. Let us jump back to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. We're going to start in verse 1. I'm going to read a little bit to you and we're going to discuss it. It's a, it, for those of you that brought your Bible, let me tell you something. Um, especially for you students that don't have a cell phone, it's important that you have a Bible and it's important that you have it with you. It's important that you read it. Okay? This word is alive and active. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. It cuts the bone from the marrow, the soul of the man from the spirit of the man. It is good for reproof, correction, insight, and direction. Anything you need is in the pages of these books led by the Holy Spirit. So you've got to have it on hand. And so we're going to read. I like my glow-in-the-dark Bible that I can carry in my pocket, but there's something about the written words on a page when you turn that and you smell, you smell what a Bible and a book smells like, and then those words jump off the page. And so if you don't have a Bible, get with us. We'll get you one. You need to have the Word of God in your hand. Amen? Amen. Staff, it's the same for you. If you don't have a Bible, let's get a Bible. Amen? Amen. Glory, here we go. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 verse 1. This chapter is called, it's called the excellence of love. Paul says, if I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but do not have love, I have become a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. In other words, I'm just making noise. If I give the gift of prophecy and know all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. And if I give all of my possessions to feed the poor, and if I surrender my body to be burned, but do not have love, it profits me nothing. Then he goes on in verse 4, and, and we, we will quote this. We usually quote this at weddings, um, but actually this is really sad for your life. You need to know this as a guideline for your life. It's not just for a man and a woman when they get married. Verse 4 says, love is patient, love is kind. It is not jealous, love does not brag, and is not arrogant, does not act unbecomingly, it does not seek its own, is not provoked, does not take into account a wrong suffered, does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Verse 8, love never fails. But if there, if, but if there are gifts of prophecy, they will be done away with. If there are tongues, they will cease. If there is knowledge, it will be done away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when the perfect one comes, the partial will be done away with. When I was a child, I used to speak like a child, think like a child, and reason like a child. When I became a man, I did away with childish things. But for now we see in the mirror dimly, but when then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I will know fully, just as I also have been fully known. 
Some of you need to know that you are fully known and fully seen by the Father. Verse 13. But now, when? Now. Faith, hope, love abide, these three things, but the greatest of these is love. The greatest of these things is love. We quote the Scripture in John chapter 15, 13. Most of you in here know it. It says, Greater love has no one than this, that someone laid down his life for his friends. We use that in the context, we usually use that in the context of Jesus giving his life at the cross. And that's great context, that's what we're speaking of. But how about when you lay down your interest for somebody else? How about, how about you love them enough to get outside of your own pride and your own understanding to do something to benefit somebody? How about you get outside of what you normally would do expecting something in return, but I give you an unconditional love because see, truly, the finest definition of love is doing something for somebody that they can never do for you. When I don't put an expectation on you, but yet I love you, what I have done is I have laid my life down for you. Because our human emotion and our human demeanor is get all I can and can all I get and however it benefits me, that's what I want. Everybody has an agenda. Everybody likes for things to be done for them, to them, through them, and around them. But the reality of it is, is when I can sit before you and I can love you with no expectation of you, then truly I'm laying my life down and saying it's no longer about me because what it is is if I show you agape love, it doesn't mean I have to accept bad behavior, but what it does is I have to meet you. What it means is I meet you where you're at and I love you in the condition you are and as I, as I cover you with agape love, what I'm doing is I'm giving this salve of love by the Holy Spirit that will bring you to health. Because the Word says... If God is love, it also says it is the goodness of God that, that draws men to repentance or to salvation. The reality of it is, is we're expecting Jesus to come down out of the throne room and do what he's already done. Mm -mm. Can I tell you that God has done everything in the earth he's going to do? Jesus has done everything in the earth He's going to do. He said it is finished. Then what they did is they came into partnership and they took the third party of them and said, but what we will do is we will take the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, and put inside of you so you'll do it the way we do it. The goodness of God that draws men to repentance is what you show people. It's how you conduct yourself with people. It's how you show compassion to those that don't show compassion back to you. When I, read, when I read the New Testament, especially the Gospels, and I see men like Jesus, how they are treated in the earth, but yet everything that flows back out of Him is love. Yes. Come on now. It wasn't even about the persecution and the things that He faced. That was to fulfill prophecy. But it was so that love could be released in the earth so that those that didn't know Him could know Him. Yes. Paul, who was the persecutor of Christians, he's absolutely probably outside of Jesus, David, Paul, and Peter are my very favorite characters in the Bible. They all have very similar parallels about them. But what I love about them is that once they, once they are in with the Lord, they're in with the Lord. In Paul, the one who was persecuting Christians, having them killed, having them tortured, when you start reading commentaries on how he was having them tortured, it is appalling the things that the Christians went through. Because you have to also understand the culture of the day. They are living in, a, they're living in an area that is ruled by the Roman Empire. The Romans were masters of torture. They prided themselves on how they tortured men. Paul adopted some of that in his, in his religious um, anger to make sure that you didn't profess the name of Jesus. And then we find him... We find in Scripture where Stephen is now, he's been teaching and preaching about Jesus, and now he finds himself in the city square, and they are stoning him to death. And the men that are about to stone him to death, they, it says that they laid their coats down at the feet of the one named Saul. It's Saul of Tarsus. It's the man who becomes Paul. He is standing there calling the shots as this man of God is being killed. But yet the very man who spewed hatred toward the Christians and who spewed hatred toward the Lord has an encounter where God says He sends Jesus to him. Knocks him off his horse. He says, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? He says, Lord, as in a question. Jesus speaks to him. You know the story from there, but what I find to be very interesting is the very man who is spewing hatred in one season of his life 
is writing letters about love from prison. He's writing letters of love after he has been himself stoned and beaten. He's been shipwrecked and bitten by a serpent. He has been persecuted and prosecuted. He's been put in the very worst places imaginable, but yet his pen continues to flow with the, with the guidelines of what love looks like. Why? Because the love he is talking about is not just a seasonal love. It's the agape love of God. It's that unconditional love of it doesn't matter where you've been. It doesn't matter what you've gone through or what has been done to you. You still have the mandate and the responsibility to let the love of the Lord come out of you. Because the reality of it is, no matter where you go and whatever you do, people are starving for love. Right? There's an old, there's an old country song said, looking for love in all the wrong places. Right? Many of us have done that in our lifetime. If you remember on Saturday Night Live, Eddie Murphy had a skit. He played, uh, he played uh, buckwheat doing it. He said, whooking Penub. Y'all can laugh in church. It's okay. But you've been looking for something that only God can give you. You've looked for it in every person, every situation, everything that stimulates you physically, and it has left you empty. That's why as the church we have a responsibility. One, individually, you've got to step into the presence and connect to the Father so that you can hear the heart of the Father, hear the word of the Father, know the essence of the Father, find His character so that whenever you come out, you are like Moses was when he came off of the mountain. Moses literally glowed with the glory of God. But it was an outward glory. Let me remind you, Moses went to the mountain, he came back, because of the glory of God reflecting off of him and around him, they had to put a veil over him because you and I couldn't look on that glory. But then the scriptures say that there is an undying or an unfading glory that comes off of us because the very presence that was on Moses is in you. So wherever you go, you let the glory of God reflect out of you so that people will truly see who the Father is. That's why every day, and I know that we miss the mark, but for pastor, I wake every, every morning and I say, Lord, less of me and more of you. Let me get out of the way. Do I do a great job of that? No. There's times that pastor gets right up in the middle of it and that's all you see. You see my personality, you see my facial expressions, you see my body language. But then when I do that and the Lord says, what are you doing? You're not showing love today. You're not showing my essence today. I have to pull away. I go to my office. I close the door. I repent because repentance is the changing of the mind. Then I say, Lord, show yourself through me today. Let me show compassion. Let me show love. So you have a responsibility it starts now. This is your training ground. Those of you that are in our program, this is your training ground. If you think you're here just to, just to get some 12 steps and learn how to be sober, you've missed the mark. This is your training ground. Sobriety is a big part of, part of it, but we're training you to, to, to show you how to be successful in life. And part of that success is taking the very lessons that you've learned here. As Paul told Timothy, take the lessons you've learned to other faithful men, Right? You can't go out of here in love with an agape love if you haven't experienced agape love. You can't go out of here in love with an agape love if you haven't practiced it here. If I can't love you in a, co in a close confine where I'm living with you, I can't love you out there where I can dodge you. And that's the truth of it. So those of you that want to argue and fight amongst yourselves, you need to change your viewpoint on how you see the person in front of you. You need to see them through the lens of how God sees them. God sees them as cherished. He sees them as handiwork. He sees them, sees them as His good pleasure. He sees them as fearfully and wonderfully made. He sees them as overcomers and conquerors. He sees them in that whether they are living in that or not, that's how God sees them. That's how He created them. You have to see them the same way. It is, it is when you do that and you love somebody without a condition that what you can do is you see the treasure in them and you begin to pull that treasure out of them. That's the responsibility of everybody is to find the treasure. The treasure is what the kingdom is, is based on. It's finding treasure. The kingdom is hidden. A lot of the time the kingdom that we're looking for is hidden in the person sitting right in front of us. Amen. And we miss the very blessings of God because we won't love somebody because we don't understand them. Usually what it is, and we've heard this, I reject what I don't understand. I'll say it again. You reject one another because you don't understand one another. 
And to be quite honest with you, the reason you reject one another because you don't understand one another is because you first rejected the Father because you don't understand Him. Amen. See, I can love you once I love the Father. The, word, the beautiful thing about the Word is this. The Father's love is never changing. It says that He loved us yet when we were still sinners. Amen. One translation says He loved us when we were His enemies. Hmm. That's interesting that he loved us when sin had set us so far apart from one another that we were actually in the position of an enemy to him, but yet he still loved us. He gave his only son for us because of his deep love for us. But yet I can't love you because I have a disagreement with you. It's interesting. It's interesting how, especially in the church world, how we navigate with one another to reject one another and not cover each other with unconditional love because we put everybody in performance mode. I'm so thankful the Lord doesn't put me in performance mode. And the truth is this. Usually because my lack of empathy and my lack of love for you, I put you in performance mode and you don't even know you have to perform to, to receive my affection. I withhold something from you that you don't even know that you have to perform for because that wasn't God's design. Because God's design was you love unconditionally. When Jesus comes back across Peter and he asks Peter, do you love me? Do you agape me, Peter? Peter comes back with and he says, I phileo you. I love you with a warm affection. Jesus says, Peter, do you agape me? Peter says, I phileo you. On the third time, finally, Jesus says, do you agape me? Finally, Peter says, I agape you. I get it. I understand what you're asking me. I love you without condition, the same way that you love me. Jesus follows it up, doesn't put him in performance mode. Jesus says, then feed my sheep. What was he supposed to feed his sheep? The very love that Peter just professed. I agape you. Now take that love and feed the sheep that love. And that's exactly what Peter did. We want to talk about the greatest exploits that these men did, laying hands on the sick, taking parts of parts of their garments and people were healed simply because of that. That was done. This says that they walked in the city and their shadow hit people and they were healed. But the thing that we forget the most is that the very thing they brought first was the very thing that Jesus brought. Love and compassion. You want to see lives transformed? You want to see deliverance happen? It starts with love and compassion first. See, the church is called to love. As a body, we're called to love the world around us. doesn't mean I have to embrace everything the world does, but I have to love the world around me. Why? Because God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believe in Him shall not perish but have everlasting life. God loved. He agape so much the entire world. The world is not the earth. The world is the inhabitants of the earth. That's the people. That's you and I. The question is, can you love the people in your world? The people that come across you. Can you love them in their broken state or do you need them to be fixed before you can love them? Do you need them to be whole before you can love them? Do you need them to agree with you wholeheartedly before you can love them? Do they need to see things exactly the way that you see them before you can love them? Can I tell you that love is not full acceptance of behavior and love is not let me bring you in closer to me so that yet you can harm me. Let me tell you, there are people that have betrayed me and they have wounded me and they have traumatized me in my life. I love them unconditionally, but our relationship is from a distance. So don't hear what I'm not saying. I'm not telling you you got to love those that have rejected you, neglected you, and abused you up close. You love them with an unconditional love. Lord, I love them the way you love them, and I release them to you with the hope that you will, you will shift their hearts. I got a phone call yesterday. It was, it was an eye-opener for me. I'm, I'm an old-school type guy, so when you... I'm, loyalty is huge to me, okay? Once loyalty is broken, I, I have a hard time with that relationship. But I've got, I got a phone call yesterday from a friend of mine and he, he said, hey, before I tell you anything, number one, you have a guest that I'm calling to talk to you about. Number two, I'm not asking you to not give him services. I'm just letting you be aware. So he told me about an incident with a guest that we had had in our building that this man's current wife was married to this other man years ago. And this man had literally almost beat his 
wife to death. It was terrible. Not just one time, but literally days and days and days in a row to where she had to have brain surgeries and reconstructive surgeries. It was a terrible thing. And as a friend to this man, my loyalty was, give me his name, give me a picture, I'll go downstairs, I'll tell Miss Shannon, he will not be allowed here because of my loyalty to you. He said, hold on. He said, regardless of what has happened, he still needs love, compassion, and he needs services. He needs food, food, clothing, and shelter. He needs the gospel, the very things that you offer. He needs those. He said, I forgive, and my wife forgives, and we let go. But we need, I want you to be aware of the type of temperament he has, but I also want you to know that he needs Jesus. He needs the love of the Lord. I can't have that relationship with him, but hopefully you can. And I walked away from that, and I thought... I don't know that I could be that gracious. To be really frankly honest with you, I don't know that I could. But yet here's a man that called and in a moment's time, he taught me once again that unconditional love comes from the Father, not from my circumstance. Unconditional love comes from the Father, not from what has been done. And I went down, I got with Miss Shannon, I gave the name, I said, hey, we just need to be aware in case he comes in, he acts a fool, you need to know what we're dealing with. I don't know that he came back. I don't know that we'll see him again. But the lesson in that is this. Unconditional love says love covers a multitude of sins. When I have unconditional love, love will cover that sin so that my heart doesn't come hard. So that I don't come so so full of animosity and distaste for you that I can't even see that you're still created in the image of the living God. And a lot of the times that's what we do. Somebody crosses our path and they say something, they do something, we don't like them, we don't like their personality, we don't like the way they talk. Let me tell you, those that have been coming to Yes Lord, there's, a, there's something I've been teaching on for years and it's this. You reject the gift because you don't like the package. You don't like the package in which God has sent it, so therefore you reject the gift. Can I tell you, usually I've learned in my life, the very person that grates on me the most is the biggest gift to my life. Whether I like it or not. That very sanding block, when they come in, the Lord says, hey, you got some rough spots. Let me sand them off of you. They have become the biggest blessing, gift, and joy in my life down the road. But because I didn't see them unconditionally, I rejected them. The question this morning is this, are you operating everything you do from love? Or are you doing it out of obligation? Staff, are we showing up at Faith City Mission because we got to punch a time clock and we're obligated to be here? Are we doing it because we don't feel like we can go do something else? I'm stuck. Or are you showing up every day because you truly love what God has called us to do? Do you truly love the vision of the mission? Do you truly love our homeless guests? Do you truly love these students that are coming in here and saying, I have nowhere else to go. Will you help me? Do you love them unconditionally? Or do you do it because you're obligated? Students, are you here because you're obligated? Are you doing it because you have no other choice? Or are you doing it <clears throat> because you want to grow and you want to learn and you want to adapt to something differently. You want your life to look differently than it ever has done. Well, it starts with love. Number one, you got to love yourself. <laughs> you got to love you. I can't love you if I don't love me and I'll never be able to love me if I don't know the love of the Father for me. So once, once you have experienced the love of the Father, then you have to change the way you see you. Once I change the way I see me, let me tell you something. I tell people all the time, I love me some me. I do. <clears throat> I, it used to not be that way in my life. My wife will tell you, there used to be a time in our house I wouldn't walk past a mirror because I couldn't stand the reflection of myself. And the reason that was is because I felt like there was no love for somebody who had done the things that I had done. And the, how in the world, if people can't love me, how in the world can the Creator love me? But yet I had an experience with the very one who loved my soul that He gave His only Son. I had that experience of what it did is it changed my view of myself. 
Once my self-view changed because of my view of the Father, guess what? My view of you changed. The way I see you is not by the things you've done, where you've come from, how you've acted. I see you the way the Father sees you. I see you as a son and a daughter. I see you as a brother and a sister. I see you as a joint heir with Jesus. So therefore, I conduct myself with you in the same manner. But it starts here. I've got to have an experience with the Father. The Father has an experience with me. He changes the way I view me. I fall in love with my divine makeup and how God has created me. And the very things that might bother me or bother you are the very things that God has put in me for such a time as this. I embrace them. We strengthen them. We use them. And then guess what? I see you that way now. It's that unconditional love that Paul talks about. Paul didn't even see his captors through the lens of offense. He saw his captors through the lens of love. That's why if you look in Scripture, whenever, <clears throat> whenever the, the prison doors are open and all the prisoners have left and the guard is fearful because all these people have left and he's fixing to take his own life, Paul says, hold up, we're still here. We have not left. Why? Because Paul knew that the shaking of the doors and the opening of the prison was bigger than just him getting out. It was so that the goodness of God could be shown to this man who was literally fixing to take his life. What does Scripture say? Because of that moment, they went to his house. It says his whole family was saved. The very way that you love somebody has a generational impact for them. Hey, I haven't gone anywhere. I'm right here. How you sit with those who are in despair says a lot about how you love. But it also says a lot on how you receive love. If somebody has put me in performance mode and i got to perform for their affection, usually they feel they have to perform for affection as well. And that's just not how the Lord has set it up. The Lord has set love to be unconditional. It's supposed to be you hear Miss Jenna say all the time, you have freely been given, freely you receive, freely you give. Freely you have received unconditional love. Freely you give that. It should be a flow. The more you realize and, and experience the love of the Father, the more it should flow out of you. Your life should be the life of unconditional love. Is that where you live today? Do you live from a position of uncondition? Or do you put everybody in performance mode? If you've put people in performance mode, you've done an injustice to them, you've done an injustice to yourself, and you've done an injustice to the Father. Because you're not doing it the way the Father has called you to do it. Let me look at some stuff here. I think I'm fixing to wrap it up. I'm going to ask you to stand with me. <clears throat> I love that this chapter is titled Excellence in Love. One of the things that, are, that, that I speak about in my home, my wife and my children, we speak frequently about how everything we need to do needs to be done with excellence. What does that look like? We don't cut a corner. We don't, we don't halfway do it. We see it through till it's finished. Why? Because we're setting the example of excellence, how things should be done. When in ministry, we set the bar that we're going to do it in excellence. That means our worship teams, they're going to practice. Our, our teachers are going to study the Word and they're going to know it before they come and orotate it. <clears throat> but also, your life needs to be a life of excellence. You love in excellence. That means you got to practice love. you got to practice it. Excellence is a lifestyle. It's not just a word. One of the things I appreciate about Faith City Mission, most of what we do, and I know there's areas that we are growing and we're rebuilding, but most of what we do is done with excellence. So much to the point that we have other missions and other homeless shelters come and they inquire, how do you do? What do you do? What does that look like? Because the bar has been set high with excellence. Excellence in love means I'm going to love you. I'm going to set the bar so high that I've got to literally, I've got to be looking to know that I'm doing it the way that it's been said. 
What I'm going to challenge you with this morning is this. As we go into our day, I want you, I want your thought today, right here at the very front of your thinking, how can I love differently today? How can I love the very man or woman in this building? It starts here. It starts with our family. I told you in my home, with my family, everything we do in our house is with excellence. Why? Because if I don't do it there, I can't do it anywhere else. This is our family. So right here in our own home, we're going to start doing it with excellence. How can I love the very one that I've been at odds at with this week? It's only Wednesday. <laughs> only Wednesday. You've got plenty of time before the week's over. How can I love differently? How can I love with excellence? How can I show the unconditional love of God to the very person that I don't like the most? That's your challenge today. Find every opportunity to show unconditional love today. Okay. Every guest, every staff member, every student, every volunteer, those construction workers that are down there and they've got our entire flow disrupted with the jackhammering and the noise and the stuff. <laughs> I sat in my office, Raymond, and Raymond warned me. He said, hey, they're gonna start a little earlier on the jackhammering and the floor downstairs. And I was like, okay, cool. Well, I learned I learned very, very quickly that where they're jackhammering is directly underneath my office. I'm up there trying to write and do emails and answer phone calls. And barrr, it's shaking the floor. The first 10 minutes of it, I was agitated. And then the Lord said, what are you irritated about? That noise. The Lord said, you're making noise right now. <laughs> Quit being, I'm not irritated with you. And then what happened was, is every time they would jackhammer, bless them, Lord. Burr, bless them, Lord. Burr, Lord, bless they're coming in and they're going out. Burr, Lord, make them the head and not the tail. And you know what happened when I came down? Instead of five and a half hours of jackhammering, and me being irritated when I was leaving for the day, I came down and I found Zach and I found his guys and I blessed them. Hey, Thank you for what you're doing. Thank you for being here. Thank you for your diligence. Thank you for your work ethic. Thank you for blessing us. I loved them unconditionally. It wasn't easy. In the natural, I had a headache by the time I walked out of that office. But you know what? It wasn't about that. It was about, can I show the love of the Lord? And then Zach said to me, he goes, man, I'm sorry. He goes, I really thought you guys would be, and he goes, it was a lot louder than we anticipated. He goes, I thought you guys would be a little bit more agitated with us. <laughs> oh, no, absolutely not. <laughs> we love you. <laughs> Forefront of your mind today, I'm going to love without condition. I'm, I'm going to love without you having to be in performance mode. I'm going to love you where you're at. Because when I do that, and when you do that, we literally see lives transform in front of us. And then we see the goodness of God take root in somebody. And that's really what we're here for. Amen? Amen. Let me pray over you and I'll bless you and we'll be dismissed. Lord, I thank you. I thank you for this opportunity to come and to share your word with your sons and your daughters, with my brothers and my sisters. And Lord, I ask you today that you will stir up the spirit of love in us. Lord, that we will love without condition that I will love the very one who comes across my path and agitates me the most, that I will love them with an agape love. I will love them with the same type of everlasting love that you love me with so that they will see the goodness of God in the land of the living. And so, Lord, I ask you to bless us and keep us. Let your face shine down upon us. Turn your countenance to us. Be gracious to us and give us peace. And I pray today, Lord, that we prosper and all goes well with us as our souls prosper. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.